Welcome to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen, where we help you navigate the challenges of feeding your family and learn about the role food plays in our health and relationships. Feeding and food relationships can be stressful, confusing, and even destructive. I'm Kristen Saxena, a pediatrician and mother of four who's been researching and sharing what I've learned about feeding for over 10 years. In this podcast, I'll share my experience and expertise to help our kids and ourselves with everyday survival tips for real parents. This podcast is about progress, not perfection. So let's get started. Welcome back to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen. I'm your host, Dr. Kristen Saxena. And today is episode three of our three-part series on food advocacy. Today, we're gonna be talking with a pediatrician who recognized the importance and the impact of diet-related disease on our kids and really uh, use that information to make some substantial and exciting and innovative changes within her own practice and also to start a nonprofit organization to kind of help bring those changes and some important curriculum to children all over the country. Uh, So I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Namali Fernando. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on your show. And you are, oh gosh, we're so glad to have you. Um, And you're a pediatrician, you're practicing in Virginia. Mom of two boys. Mom of two boys. And the owner, oh, go ahead, yeah. And very different eaters too, which we can get to later, but yes. That's on my list of things to ask you about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But also, so you're the owner of a private practice called Yum Pediatrics, and it's very unique practice that I wanna also ask you a little bit more about, but has a teaching kitchen and a teaching garden within your, your pediatric practice. And then founder of a website, dryum.org, which has tons of resources for parents. And then also uh, an author. So she's co-author of Raising a Healthy, Happy Eater. And that is a guide for parents in teaching, teaching them how to feed their child stage by stage. We were talking about this kind of before we started the show. It's a really good read. And I think that that stage by stage um method is really useful and important for parents Um, and excitingly enough she's also agreed to give away a copy of this book and all you need to do to be eligible to uh, win one of those copies is to share our facebook post any of the facebook posts about this episode on your site and we will enter you to win one of those books Um, and then along your long list of accomplishments. Also, you are the creator of uh, the Dr. Yum project or a Dr. Yum curriculum for preschoolers, teaching them about healthy, fresh eating, helping them be more adventurous eaters. Yes, Dr. Yum's preschool food adventure, which has been quite the adventure over these past years, seeing that grow. So that is so impressive. Um, I think it's just really, really exciting that you've done all of this. And what I really wanted to kind of ask or what I love to ask um, is kind of how did you get here? So what was what was your motivation for starting this and and what's sort of been the ride along the way? Well, it it's been a, a journey for sure. Um, I have been seeing patients um, in pediatrics for about 22 years now. I spent the first part of that in academics. And then when I moved our family um, here to Virginia with my husband, I joined a private practice. I had trained in Houston and I saw a lot of pediatric obesity in Texas. And somehow I thought well, it might be different here in Virginia and it just wasn't at all. And So I was really kind of um, saddened by the rates of pediatric obesity that I was seeing. And I thought, well, this is my community now. I'm going to get to know these families and figure out how I can help. And I just started spending more time asking people what they fed their kids. And what I realized is that so many kids beyond just kids I was seeing with obesity really weren't eating a great diet. And so many of the symptoms that I was seeing, whether they were GI symptoms or behavioral symptoms, were um, related to their diet. And I thought, well, we really just need to do better. And I found myself wanting to just give families more hands-on information, because as you know, 
we can tell parents that they need to feed their children better, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily help because we all know that, right? Like mm-hmm. we all know we could be eating better. Food is a journey and we can all improve, but how do you do that is the problem, right? Mm-hmm. So I just started pa- passing out recipes. I'm really lucky in that my family, um, I grew up in a family where we cooked and I was kind of my mom's sous chef growing up. And so I just kind of learned how to cook really fast, easy meals and improvise and kind of use what you have on hand. So it was really easy to me, but I realized that it necessar- it wasn't necessarily that easy for everybody if you didn't grow up doing it. Mm-hmm. So I just started putting recipes on a little website and I called it Dr. Yum. And um, I would tell my par- parents to go and visit the website and try some of the recipes. And I would tell them, these are family recipes. Um, my boys were really young at that time. This was back in 2011 when I started the website. And I said, you know, my kids are really little and they eat this stuff. So I'm sure your kids will too if they practice enough. And that made such a difference. All of a sudden, I was seeing the needle moving and all these families were coming back and saying, you know what, my kids ate your shipwreck salmon or they had your chicken marbella or, you know, they tried this cool, you know, vegetable side dish that I didn't think they would try. And um, it was really wonderful to see that that was making a difference. And so I just got hooked. I was like, this is fun. I love this work and I want to do it in all the ways that I can. So I started teaching little classes after school. I borrowed a little um, uh, kitchen, uh, actually a big kitchen um, in one of our uh, churches in our community and we would have after school classes and it just became fun for me. And so I invited another pediatrician and some other professionals in my community to start a nonprofit around this work. And we called it the Dr. Yum Project. And um, we've really grown our programs over the years. What I love about this work is that all the people I work with are really fearless. So we love to sort of find out what are the barriers to eating well and try to come up with solutions. And we're not afraid to fail. And some things um, have stuck to the wall, which has been great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredible. So when you you're saying that when you first started kind of creating these recipes on this website, was that back when you were you working within a group? Like a I was working within a group. Yes, at that time. And um, and just sort of growing this little passion of mine. Uh-huh. Right. And I had um, in my station wagon at the time <laughs> I had like aprons and whisks and stethoscopes and otoscopes and it was bananas and I was driving from work to the kitchen and stopping at the farmer's market and getting our ingredients and it was fun and my kids came along with me which was great they kind of grew up in this madness Mm -hmm. Um, and then at some point I said you know what I really want to bring these two passions of seeing patients and this community work into one space. Um, It will make my life a little easier if I don't have to (laughs) drive around. around Yeah. Yeah. And I had a home, you know, if I could have a home base. So I kind of envisioned like, what would that look like? And could I put everything in one roof? And could I have a practice that had a kitchen? And could we build a garden around it? And could it be just kind of a community space that we share? Um, And so I noodled that around for a little while and and thought, okay, I'm going to do this. So I I quit this job that I loved and I thought, um, I'm just going to give this a try. And I decided to open my own practice and found this space and um, put a big teaching kitchen in the space and that's amazing pulled out all the landscaping and put in a bunch of blueberries and tomatoes <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, you know it's wonderful because there's a synergy these are two very separate entities my practice and the nonprofit mm-hmm. but they synergize and and connect with each other so beautifully because what I'm able to do is see real life barriers in action, seeing patients every day. And then I can go to the teaching kitchen and work with the team and say, okay, can we create a class around this? Can we create content on the website? And then we put that there and then we try it out on the patients again, you know, so it, it just keeps giving to each other. Um, and I think it's made us stronger because we have that 
anchor in seeing real life families every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, like, I definitely relate to what you're saying in the sense that in pediatric practice, I mean, I think that the diet related diseases, the concerns with eating, um, the things that we're seeing in kids younger and younger is just so compelling when you're actually in it, seeing those kids every day. Um, and I felt the same way. Like, I feel like it just motivates you when I see that to me, it was like, this is, this is the biggest health problem by far facing our kids right now, in my opinion. And it's just, you, you feel a little bit in that, in that space of just seeing one, you know, kid for 15, 20 minutes. It's like, you feel so helpless. Like, what can I do? Because like you said, there's so, it's so simple yet so complicated. And there's so much, so many barriers that families face that that, alone is not it never it never feels like an adequate amount of time to be able to offer the help that you want to offer and so yeah I mean honestly like when I heard about your clinic it was just so innovative and like I, I just admired it so much because I was like what an amazing like who who would think of doing this and it's so brilliant and like I think it's just so I hope that like other people within the medical community in particular find that sort of motivation and say like, you know, I could do things differently and maybe you can kind of find those ways. Those What are the other ways that I can impact my patients and impact my communities when I know that I'm seeing these issues? And it's just, I think that when you're in that position, it just feels very defeating when you're like, what am I supposed to do to help these people? This yeah. isn't enough. Like this isn't adequate. And I'll, t- and I'll tell you right now it is, it feels more important because our kids have spent so much time now during this pandemic mm-hmm. at home and they're fretting, they're worrying, they're isolated. And what do we do when we're stressed? Some of us, I know I do, <laughs> we eat, yeah. right? We're home, we're bored. We have all this unopposed energy. And this year, the rates of obesity that, that, um, rate of rise has doubled. And so mm-hmm. that is just p- so palpable seeing patients this past summer for all of the back to school well visits. Kids typically who, you know, should be gaining 10, 12 pounds a year are gaining 20, 30, 40 pounds. Um, it's really gone off the rails for so many families. And it's very understandable. We had a whole different set of priorities this year. We were yeah. in survival mode. And for a lot of us, nutrition fell to the wayside, but it really has impacted these kids. I'm diagnosing kids with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, lots of insulin resistance and type two diabetes. Um, I just read something from a children's hospital that, um, basically said that these kids that are presenting with type two diabetes, first of all, it's presenting more rapidly. There's more, more incidence of type two diabetes, but they're also presenting so much sicker too. Yeah. Um, a lot of kids in, in ketoacidosis, which is, as you know, a very sick presentation. Mm-hmm. I mean, life threatening <laughs> and life threatening ICU kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's, more our work at the Dr. Young Project at this moment feels more important than ever. It was really interesting in the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't think it was going to last that long. Everybody's like, let's cook at home. And we were like, oh, it's our moment. And yeah. we tried to get people to kind of take stock of like, their cooking repertoire and give them new ideas and inspiration, but we all got really tired somewhere (laughs) along the way. (laughs) I think that's true. And, you know, I really wanted to ask you about that because I have found um, the data, like you said, that's coming out just of the impact that this is having on childhood obesity rates, um, diabetes, all those things that you're saying. I mean, it's, it's very substantial, significant and worrisome to me. Um, Sure. And I think it's just like you said, I think that uh, s- some of the responses I've seen to that kind of data online um, is, you know, sometimes negative in the sense that like, of course they did, like give everyone a break. And I feel like I, I hope that people don't think that or maybe they are like, I don't want anyone to be coming from a blaming type like it isn't, no. it isn't our guilt trip on parents. This isn't um, something wrong with the children. Like you said, right. this is very understandable, but it shouldn't yeah. be ignored, I guess, is yeah. the other piece. It's, it's understandable. I understand why we got here, but 
we need to address it. And we should also look at like, look at why we got here. Cause I think that also spells like it was just holding a, a magnifying glass to me on the things that kind of, kind of are leading to these things anyway. It just really magnified them. So, um, hundred percent. Yeah. And I do feel like we can learn from that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we've been back to school here in Virginia for, um, you know, over a month now. And, We've seen lots of kids having to go back into quarantine, lots of COVID exposures. We've had schools close temporarily. So this could happen again, hopefully mm -hmm. not for such a prolonged time, but we can really learn from what happened last time. And, and when we do have to shift again, if we do have to shift again, what could we learn and how could we do better? I think is where our head should be now. And, um, and you know, I find myself you, having to prioritize too. I mean, sadly, a lot of these kids are very anxious and depressed and we're mm -hmm. still picking up the pieces from that year off and they've gained a lot of weight and have kind of those health repercussions. And I'm finding myself having to prioritize, okay, let's get you feeling better. And then we can talk about nutrition because, um, we can't do it all at once. It's too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we do have to sometimes, kind of figure out what's most important. And for a lot of these kids, it's just getting them feeling better and getting mm -hmm. their mental health back in order first. I think that that, I mean, that makes so much sense. And I really love your approach to it in the sense that, you know, it's, I think it's something we shouldn't brush under the rug by any means, because the unfortunate part to me is like the data suggests, like, unfortunately for kids, you know, if, if you are an obese child, the odds are much, much higher yeah. that you'll be an obese adult. So it's not necessarily something that's going to go away on its own. And like you said, right. it's kind of the, the future is tenuous in the sense we're not really sure what to expect. Are we all right. gonna be quarantined again? Are schools going to close? I don't think anybody knows for sure, sure. at this point. So I, I really love what you're saying as well about but sometimes you need to look at like, A, what's, what's the biggest problem here? And sometimes that's really the upstream you know, or am right. I having trouble with my eating because I'm dealing with depression or anxiety? Um, and so I love that. And I think that that's another thing to me, especially within the medical community, is to kind of look at the whole picture and why right. are we here? Because like you said, you, that a lot parents know a lot what they should do. Yeah. It's just yeah. the practicality of making it happen on a day-to-day -day basis is, is the difficult yeah. part. So... And and just a quick plug for let's not forget to come in for those well visits too, because, yes. um, you know, I've seen, I've seen where we have gone a little bit too long between these well visits. And by the time we get to us, so much of this is so out of hand, whether it's the obesity or the mental health. And, um, I know sometimes it feels scary to come into the doctor's office in a pandemic, but there is really important work that we can do to keep your kit, your kids healthy. Um, and so many of us are working hard to keep them safe while they're in the office too. And so, and you had alluded to this, you know, I think that there's lessons to be learned in terms of how, how this may be amplified or kind of, like I said, like held a magnifying glass to some of the issues that are creating these diet related diseases. Um, I mean, like what, what lessons do you feel like you've learned or that you try to teach to your patients? Yeah, I mean, there there are so many. I would say um, if you can make space for good nutrition, um, because it really is much more connected to our overall health than I think a lot of us feel. Um, and also, you know, just for kids, they're going to eat what's in the home. Mm -hmm. This is this is a big thing. When you bring food that's highly palatable and not very nutritious and very easy to overeat, kids are going to eat it. This idea of willpower is sort of a myth. Um, if we don't have the willpower, then of course kids aren't going to. So, you know, if we can just monitor what we're bringing into the home, I think it's so much easier for the kids. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if they're doing school at home, keeping a schedule, I think, is really important, too. I think if kids have access to food throughout the day, 
Um, it's so much different than when they're at school and they're eating these set meal times. Mm -hmm. And so you can pack a lunch for school at home, right? Yeah. And you pull that lunch out of the fridge and that's what you're eating. And it's not just that you're going back to the snack basket and doing that kind of unconscious overeating. Um, I think those things are really important to kind of keep that in the front of your mind and schedule as if you were back in school. I think it makes it easier for the kids too. Kids like structure. Yes. Um, and it helps them. I agree. I thought that was one of my big takeaways. And, you know, it was hard because you don't really have the the evidence to prove that. But that was my my thought is I felt like a lot of it just came from just living through it in your own house. It was like it was really right. the lack of structure, I think, that made yeah. it difficult. And it was for everybody because you had either, you know, kids at home by themselves because their parents were working or you had parents right. trying to work from home and it was just difficult right. to manage. And so I think kids ended up like grazing and snacking through the day. Um, and so to me, I've always been a proponent of, I think that the structure and getting that down is just an easy step to start you on the right path. And I think yeah. that that was a huge, con has been a huge contributor um, to what we're seeing now. Yeah, and the structure can even involve getting it all hands on deck for meal prep, too. Mm -hmm. I think we always say at the Dr. Ann Project, the meal starts when you start cooking, right? Yeah. And so many families feel like, okay, I've got to do this chore of cooking. And the kids are over here doing their thing, and mom and dad are over here slaving away. But it really can be a family experience and provide that structure at the end of the day where you're debriefing about the day and cooking. And guess what? Especially with your little ones, that sensory experience of cooking is getting them to become friends with these fruits and vegetables that they're preparing. And they're more likely to want to eat, try and eat them and enjoy them ultimately. So if we can fold some of that into our week too, I think it really helps the kiddos. Yeah, and I think that's a very good segue into talking about your Dr. Yum's preschool food adventure curriculum. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so kind of the origins of that is um, I mentioned earlier that we would teach cooking classes after school. And so many of those kids had younger siblings. So when their parents would come to pick up the younger siblings, these littles would look at me and say, they, and by that time, kids were calling me Dr. Yum. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> at some point I just learned to embrace it. So they'd say, hey, I want to cook with Dr. Yum too. And I thought, oh gosh, do I, you know, we may have to create another class series for these littles. Um, and at, a, at about that time, we were seeing that in Virginia, actually we had the highest rates of obesity amongst preschoolers on the WIC program. Um, which is a, as you know, a federal program for um, infants and, ch and children and, and mothers. And um, so it was really kind of um, troubling to see that in our own backyard, so many preschoolers were needing help eating better. And so I thought, well, let's, let's try to get the message out to more people than what, than what I can teach in the church kitchen <laughs> and, um, and write a curriculum. And we'll teach and train teachers on this approach to showing kids how to enjoy these foods. And so I involved um, a speech language pathologist who became a dear friend of mine. Um, her name is Melanie Potok, and she's actually my co-author too on Raising Healthy Happy Eater. And she kind of brought this really joyful approach and very inclusive approach because we wanted to make sure that all types of eaters could learn through this curriculum, including children with special needs um, and hesitant eaters and all kinds of different eaters. So we spent the course of the summer in 2013-14 writing Dr. Yum's Preschool Food Adventure. And um, we made eight binders, which we laminated on my dining room table. <laughs> I love summer. it. <laughs> and we, we went um, to different schools and we begged about eight schools to give the curriculum a try. And it was a monthly curriculum with one fruit or vegetable introduced to the kids each month. And that first year, we just got so much great feedback. And so we started to expand it, study it. Um, and it's just grown into kind of our flagship program. 
And um, this past year, we actually became a National Head Start. Actually, this year, we became a National Head Start Association partner, um, which means we are um, interacting more with Head Starts all across the country. And we're able to show them our curriculum and we're signing up more and more Head Start programs. But our program is just... Um, unique and that is very flexible. Any daycare, early childhood um, education center, faith-based, YMCA-based, I mean, we have our list is exhaustive, um, and lots of Head Starts um, who have joined. Any kind of um, type of early childhood center can make the curriculum work for their center. And so we've enjoyed seeing that grow and we've been really lucky to bring on other experts to help us refine the program we have um a lot of teachers who have given us feedback along the way we've had little working groups that have given us feedback so every edition that we put forth is a little better than the last one um, and we've been really lucky we've seen anecdotally how kids respond to the curriculum First of all, it's not just about eating. They get to touch a pineapple and learn about how it grows and learn about what it does for their body before they even eat it. So it's making friends. <laughs> and then, then they get to cook and they'll make, you know, the pineapple month, they make a pineapple power salad, which is one of the favorite recipes of the curriculum. Um, and what's wonderful, the feedback that we've gotten is that it's empowering the kids to learn about these fruits and vegetables, to learn their names so that when they go to the grocery store, they can say, hey, I tried blueberries and I would like to have that at home. And whereas before they may not have known the names of all these fruits and vegetables. Yeah. So it's just been a joy um, we've seen how it affects families, and, and now we have the data. We've worked with a wonderful researcher, Dr. Nancy Zucker, who heads up the Center for Eating Disorders at Duke University and um, did a big study to show how it really changes attitudes and behaviors of these kids. Um, and we're just launching a huge um, uh, kind of area of Alabama, um, Head Start, so northern Alabama, uh, about 1,200 students are about to just, uh, oh, wow. in the next few days, they're about to start our curriculum, which is so exciting. We just had a big kickoff with about 288 teachers, um, and we're excited to see how those kids respond to the curriculum. It's been really fun seeing how not just the pre preschoolers, but even the teachers and their families um, change their attitudes and behaviors around food at home. And can you tell me a little bit more about those outcomes that were measured? Like what kind of metrics did they use? Yeah, so we looked at, um, we looked at a pre, we used a previously validated um, questionnaire around feeding behaviors that is commonly used in the literature. And so um, we asked, 400, um, we asked teachers of 400 children about their feeding behaviors. So how much do they enjoy food? How willing are they to try a food? Um, how excited are they about meal times? And, and then we asked that before the curriculum started and then after the curriculum. And um, what we found of these nine questions, we we're hoping that some of these would achieve statistical significance and improve over the course of nine months. Mm -hmm. And what we found is every single one of them did. So what we had seen anecdotally and heard from teachers and parents really proved to be true when we looked at that data. And what's great about this um, group in Alabama that we're reaching this year is they are also collecting data from for us and there are about 1200 kids there so we're going to be looking at some of the same measures and then we're looking at a few new things including how the teachers respond and do they feel more um, confident about teaching nutrition to this age group after going through the program and going through our training um, so we're excited to see what that shows we're hoping that these kids can stay in school long enough yes. for us to collect all of our data um, and get all of these lessons in and really get the most out of the program 
I love it. And I really, what I really like about your program, I think it really exemplifies um, the way that A, just exposure is so important. B, getting the kids involved so that, you know, they're small, but they're involved in the preparation and the benefit that 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 can offer, as well as just sort of this joyful, positive approach instead of a like, you need to eat your vegetables kind of approach. I think that to me, like those three things, it really highlights. And I love I love that approach. And I think what I love about that too is that those are takeaways that parents can use even if their child is not fortunate enough to be in a preschool that is um, has a program like this. Those to me are lessons that you can still take as a parent and say, well, I can do those things. Um, and it, I mean, like you said, you've got the data to suggest it really does sort of improve the way that these kids are approaching and looking at these foods. Yeah, there are there are a ton of studies that look at how important cooking can be um, for kids who are learning to eat and how it increases their acceptance of food. Um, so we're excited to see that in our own work. And I think, you know, one of the things we b- baked into the program. Ha is ha. This parent- Was that like a pun? No. <laughs> that was not intended. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Um, but we did. We we wanted to make sure the parents were engaged in the program, too, because it didn't make sense for the kids to learn this great approach, to have these um, experiences and then have it not go back to the home. So we built a lot of parent involvement into the curriculum. So there's a teacher manual that also is mirrored in a parent manual. So the parents actually learn what is the approach? What's the language? How do we get these kids to eat in a joyful way? How do we use the sensory experience of food to create this connection? And so that was really important to us. And then after every lesson, the parents actually get the recipe that was made in the classroom and they get a feedback sheet that says, okay, little Johnny enjoyed kale with all of his senses. Maybe he didn't try it, but he really enjoyed tearing it. So the parents know where they can then pick up and continue and they can make that recipe if Johnny really liked it. Or if they, you know, didn't know that their child liked pomegranates. Here's another recipe from the Dr. Yum website. So we have a whole other ecosystem online that's recipes and blog posts and all kinds of webinars and um, virtual classes that we want to bring those parents into. So it's not just about their kids eating well during this year of preschool, but it's bringing them into that culture of learning and exploring more about food, hopefully for a life time. Yeah. So um, we're really proud of that part. And we've really seen even in our own community, how parents start out the year kind of hesitant, like I saw that the kids are going to be eating broccoli and (laughs) not really sure about that. And then by the end of the year, the families are packing the tangy broccoli salad from the curriculum and the teachers are noticing it coming in the lunchbox. And then by the second child coming through, the kids are like, are we making tangy broccoli salad? I love that salad. You know, and it just affects each child um, in such a more profound way. And they're so excited and primed and ready for it. So that's been such a joy to kind of see that evolution over these years, too. Right. And the other thing I have to mention, um, because I've talked to you about this curriculum before, and one of the cool things that is it also comes with sort of the equipment for the kids to be involved in the cooking. And I know, like, I feel like this tip needs to be shared because one of the things that you talked about <laughs> last time was this dog knife. I, and so it's like yes. a little I don't even what do you know the brand? It's a little knife that's shaped like a dog. Yes, it is the most magical, transformative (laughs) tool that you can have if you have a small child at your house. So it's called the Kunrakan dog knife. We'll put links to it um, in our show notes because I think everyone with small kids should have this. Yeah, we have it in our we have it in our store. You can see some of our other fave products and cooking tools and stuff. But um, yeah, we I started using this when my kids were really little and they became these sous chefs like they're four and five years old just chopping like bosses with these knives 
And it's kind of like you have to do a double take because they're real knives, but the way that they're made, they're Swiss. They're very effective at cutting, but they, they're dull enough that they won't cut hands. Um, yeah. And so we teach kids how to hold the puppy dog knife and how to make their holding hand, whatever they're holding the fruit and vegetables safe. So they, we tell them to make a little kitty cat paw. And then these kids, three and four in our teaching kitchen and in the curriculum too, are literally chopping fruits and vegetables and being helpful. And it makes them feel like they're part of the experience. They're so happy to participate in a really kind of grown up way. So yeah, that's that's the best tool. My kids use those for years and then we graduated them to, you know, bigger knives. And by that time they knew good knife techniques yeah. and that's and safety. So, um, yeah, it's a great way to start. I agree. Yeah. I, I'm sad. I only found out about it now, but I ended up, <laughs> I thought, well, that's really cool. I'll check it out. And my daughter's six, my youngest is six, but I gave it to her. Yeah. And I mean, she, she, she cooks with me anyway, but yeah, she was like, what can I cut? This is the coolest thing ever because normally, you know, kids that age, that's kind of not usually a job that you'll give them is chopping the vegetables <laughs> and they I mean right. she was cutting every grape in half that she could find like it's it's very motivating and I think that that really gets those kids excited to be able because I think sometimes we just leave them out because we think it's not safe or you know other jobs right. you're like this is gonna be so messy um, and so just those little those little tools or those little tricks of the trade I think can make a huge difference in getting those kids oh. excited about helping and I'll tell you that investment that you're making right now will pay off. And I'll tell you over the years, you know, I started them out of these, as these little bitties chopping. By the time I opened my practice, they were big enough where they were starting to cook independently. And so I, I could sometimes call home and be like, we're making the colorful turkey chili, you guys start chopping. And by the time I get home, like everything would be prepped, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it and pays then, off for your for yourself as a parent in the future, right? I'm so telling it's just you, I'm invest telling now. You. <laughs> yeah, and and now I've seen it come full circle where um, my 18 year old, he just started his sophomore year in college. He um, during the pandemic, he was cooking all the time and really helped me th through those stressful months because um, he was home. Yeah, and it was wonderful to see. And he just joined his um, cooking club at his college. And he's a, a, a sophomore officer of the cooking club at That's his so cool. university. And he's really enjoying cooking. And it's funny, I, I never knew that if he really liked it or not, but I guess he does. Yeah, so you must have, must have rubbed off on him a little bit. <laughs> but that does bring me that I did want to talk to you about because I think it's very valuable. Like, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges that you faced in feeding your own kids? Because I mean, obviously, you are a very busy working mother. Um, and so kind of like you said, you know, I always felt in pediatrics, I, I've said this before, but before I had my kids, I felt like I knew everything I needed to do. And then once I got them, it was like, I, I it's yeah. so hard to get everything done. And so obviously yeah. this is something that's very important to you and that you're very passionate about, but I'm yeah. sure many yeah. challenges still arose. Absolutely. I mean, our mission at the Dr. Young Project is helping families and communities overcome barriers to eating well. And you and I were talking about for different families, there are different barriers. It could be access to food it could be financial resources it could be you know help in the kitchen and help raising the ch children um i think the universal barrier though is time yes like every that's kind of what everybody feels is how do i fit it in and so obviously you know being a professional too and trying to get all of that in time was is always a factor and so so much of what we put into the Dr. Yum project approach is really how do you solve that problem of time? And so all of our recipes are very um, quick and easy. A lot of them make leftovers. So um, I know I am a woman who is not above leftovers. No, <laughs> and, <you're> my favorite. <laughs> yeah, if um, I'm having them tonight, actually, and <laughs> you know, if I want to get home cooked food on the table most nights, I know I don't have time every night to cook a meal. So I 
I'm very strategic. And I used to waste a lot of time going to the grocery store and being like, what am I making tonight? And I just learned for, for myself that planning out those meals mm -hmm. and knowing which nights are leftovers nights just makes the week go faster and better. And um, and we still are eating great food every night and mm -hmm. we're not having to go through the drive through or make like a game day, like do we get takeout to kind of a decision. Um, so that, you know, that, I think is an approach that we are very conscious about. And so we've built a meal planner and we've built our Meal-O-Matic, which is, you know, a custom recipe tool. So like, let's say you haven't planned and you have all of these little bits of vegetables and things that might even go bad by the end of the week. How do you get those into a customized recipe? Well, that Meal-O-Matic will just kind of make it for you. Um, so I think having gone through this whole arc of having small children and working and stuff has helped me to kind of figure out what the shortcuts are yeah, and how to save time and to do recipes that are easy. And if you're buying good food, it doesn't have to be that you have to do a big elaborate cooking situation. You know, it yeah. can be that you're just fixing the food and, and serving it fresh. Um, and kids kind of love it that way too, you know? Yeah, I think that that, I mean, a lot of the things you said, I think really resonate in the sense that just that little bit of pre-planning like every week, even mm -hmm. if it's just loose planning and I've talked about this with other people, sometimes if, if all it takes is to know like, you know, on Mondays we do meatless Mondays, on Tuesdays yeah. we do Mexican taco Tuesdays, on Wednesdays we do leftovers or whatever it is, just that little bit um, saves you, I think, just like you said, when you, if you wait till the end of the day, you sometimes just set yourself up for failure. You're tired. You've got decision fatigue from the rest of the day and right. everyone's hungry and you're just much more likely to make a choice that later you might not feel the greatest about. So I think yeah. that that really resonates with me. Um, but I also wanted to say, you said earlier um, that you had two very different eaters growing up. Yes. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit more about that? I have two boys, they're four years apart, and they could not be more different humans <laughs> in every way, shape, and form. Um, so my oldest, who's the one who likes to cook, he was always very, had a very easy, gregarious personality, but he was not an adventurous eater growing up. So he needed a lot more practice. And I tell parents this story a lot when they say, you know, we tried broccoli fit five times and he still doesn't like it. And I would say, you know, I had a kiddo who didn't like tomatoes and for 12 years, <laughs> we practiced tomatoes. I thought this kid is going to leave my house liking tomatoes because a lifetime of picking tomatoes off of sandwiches and not enjoying a fresh garden tomato just does not seem fun. So um, it took him that long. I mean, literally mm -hmm. probably from the age of three till the age of 15, we just tried them and tried them and tried them. And finally he was like, you know what? They're not so bad. And then I'll never forget, we were in an Italian restaurant and he ordered a caprese salad with fresh tomatoes and I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> I could not believe it. Um, so he took a lot more work. There are still a few things he doesn't love. So when he's home on breaks, I try to <laughs> get him to try them like mushrooms, for instance. Um, my second child, who was always a little bit more of a challenge in all the different ways, <laughs> was the easiest eater. He just grew up, you know, eating all, drinking all the smoothies. He loved everything spicy, throw sriracha on it. He loved it. And he didn't need a lot of practice. And I think this is important for parents to understand is that feeding and learning to eat is a developmental process. Yes. And every child is different and every child um, goes at a different pace. And so some kids learning to read or learning to walk, they just need more time and practice and patience. And um, it's very easy to say, well, this one's the picky one and this one's the good eater, right? Yep. Um, but when you say that around children, they start to believe it, mm -hmm. right? And we would never say, well, he's a bit bad reader and he's a good reader. We would spend more time with our reader who took more 
patients in practice and we would get them to the point where they were reading well, but we wouldn't label them necessarily, mm -hmm. right? So if we can think about feeding as a developmental process and just kind of set in our minds that some kids just take longer, they need more practice, they need more tries, yep. you know, and we just have to keep our chin up and keep a good attitude and keep it fun. We can bring them along without them fe necessarily feeling bad about themselves. I love that. And I think it's a very important message for parents to hear because I feel the same way. Like, I'm a pediatrician, you're a pediatrician, you're passionate about food and helping kids to eat better. And yet in your own house, you have the kid that's picking stuff off their sandwich and saying like, <laughs> I don't eat that, it's gross. And so part of you is like, what am I doing? Like, I can't even do this. How can anyone do it? But on the flip side, it's like, nope, this is just real life and real parenting. And like you said, I mean, I think it's giving yourself that grace to be like, you know what? Nobody, yeah. nobody is perfect. Even people who are very passionate about this and devoting hours of their life to it right um, it, but then also the long play to say but you know what we're gonna keep tomatoes around at dinner and maybe when you're in college you're gonna order <laughs> tomatoes and we're all gonna be floored because i think it, that's the reality is it just it if you wait long enough it will maybe come around. So to yeah. keep the faith. Yeah. <laughs> keep the faith, that's right. Well, um, before we move on to the next segment, I did just wanna say, if you could ask parents to make one change in their home when it comes to their relationship with feeding their family, what would that be? I would say disconnect your stress, right? So, so much of meal time, if we're worried about our kids eating, is spent worrying mm -hmm. right instead of really just taking advantage of the fact that we're enjoying a meal together this is time we can connect um sometimes when we worry about our ch children's nutrition we're too busy counting the bites of asparagus yeah and can you just take one more bite and we're missing the moment and if you can bring that joy to the table the habits come right like my my 18 year old who took forever to eat tomatoes, you just have to put in that time and keep it joyful. Um, and if you're feeling particularly stressed about mealtime and it's impacting your family and how you parent, there are people who can help you. And that also I think is another important message. If you talk to your pediatrician and let them know that you're stressed, there are people like speech language pathologists like my friend Melanie Potok, an occupational therapist, whose job is to help families with challenges around feeding. And so that is, I think, a super important thing to keep in mind if you're trying all the things, you've gone and you've gotten the advice and it's just not working and you feel like you're getting deeper into the stress, ask for help because there are people who can help you. Yes, love that. Okay, I'm going to move on to our, the next segment of our podcast, which I don't know if you knew about, but it's something we call Ask Me Anything. So I have questions oh. from our listeners. It's Ask Me Anything, but it's really Ask You Anything, too. Okay. Um, so my first question is from Ashley. She says, my kids help with meal planning and prepping, but still seem to want the same food all the time. What are ways to honor their input, but still get them to expand their taste? Hmm. So there are three types of foods when it comes to kids. There are favorite foods. So mac and cheese, mm -hmm. perfect example of a favorite food for many kids. Then there are sometimes foods, right? So sometimes they like them, sometimes they won't. Maybe it's sweet potatoes. Sometimes I'll eat them, but sometimes they'll pass. And then maybe there are the practice foods like asparagus or artichokes or you know something that you just have on your wish list that you hope your kids will love someday so as parents we often serve that favorite food and we'll try the practice food and we get discouraged because they always eat the favorite food and they don't go into the practice food but if we served the sometimes food with the practice food then they're more likely to eat the sometimes food and they might even dabble in the practice food. Mm -hmm. And if you do keep doing that, rinse and repeat, <laughs> right? Yep. Practice yep. and sometimes. Well, guess what happens? The, the sometimes food becomes a favorite food mm -hmm. and the practice food becomes a sometimes food. 
Yep. Right. So if we can just put that on repeat, it's important to not serve the favorite foods all the time mm-hmm. because they just will go to those. And I liken it in this um, new edition of Raising a Healthy, Happy Eater. We liken it to books, right? If you your child has a favorite book that's like a Dr. Seuss book, they want to read it all the time. They know the story. They want to keep saying it over and over and over. It's almost like they memorize it. But we know there are bigger and better books with better stories. And we've got to bring those off the shelf and start practicing those and put Dr. Seuss away for a little bit, yeah. right? And it's not that we can never bring him back. We can bring that story back sometimes and enjoy it and remember it and recite it. But we've got to practice those bigger books first, and then we can move those on and try even better books with bigger stories and longer chapters. So it's very similar to that. we got to kind of get them off the stuff that's easy and practice. Yes, I think, like you said, you can't really overstate the importance of just sort of that repeated exposure and Mm -hmm. not getting deflated when it seems like I have served this to my kid a hundred (laughs) times. Just just never give up. I think it's like the thing that I said, just put a little bit on their plate because I, we can't, it doesn't seem like it should take that long, but it truthfully it, does. So just it stick the, with it. The research shows on average, it takes about eight to 10 tries, but the range is two tries to 47 tries. Right. That's a lot of tries. I mean, it really, it takes a lot of patience to do that many tries. For 12 years of tomatoes, I've done it and it does pay off eventually. Yeah. So I, I mean, I guess my advice to her would just be to keep doing what you're doing. You're having them involved in the planning. You're having them involved in the prepping. I, like you said, I think that favorite foods, you don't need to eliminate them. I mean, we wouldn't want to do that as an adult. I'm not going to do that. I would just like any family member, you kind of honor like, Hey, I know this is your favorite dinner and we're having it tonight, but also just don't give up on those foods that you would like them to eat more of. Keep them part of the regular rotation. So those just become the familiar, normal friend foods. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So next question is from Derek. Um, in changing eating habits for kids or adults, are there results? Are the results better with just going all in and changing everything at once, or is it better to slowly change things like switching out soda for water, switching out fries for broccoli? I do think going gradually is a little bit gentler for kids and it doesn't feel so punitive. And so, I don't know, unnerving. Um, I think kids like routine and familiarity. So switching out one thing at a time is probably enough. And you want change to be lasting too, right? If you try to do everything all at once, you're going to get tired and you're going to get discouraged. Um, But if you can do it more gradually, I do think it is more likely to last. I agree. What do you think? I think so too. I mean, I think that with almost anything, um, it's usually not sustainable to do these like giant overhauls. I feel like the rate of success with that is usually much lower there was a reason you weren't doing that before and so to think that you can like a hundred percent like change your life overnight i think it is an unreasonable ask for you and your child uh and so i love that idea i love the idea of you know making a, a a choice like what is it look at what is the change you actually think that you can make is this something that will make a substantive difference like i mean you know if it's something you hardly ever eat anyway saying well i'm never going to eat you know, something that's bad for me. It's like, well, you'd really hardly ever did anyway. This isn't really, right. a, this isn't really an important change that you're making. But I think looking at what do we do? What's a, what's a doable thing for me? Right. And then making that change. And I love the idea too, like with this, um, I think people do a lot better with adding in versus eliminating. Eliminating altogether, I think is also often a, a recipe for failure because yeah, for me, at least as soon as someone tells me I can't have something or do something, oh, that's all I think about. Right. Yeah. So right. I think just making a switch, but telling yourself that this isn't, this isn't gone and off limits. This is just a positive 100%. change I'm making for myself. So we always talk about our team talks about, we don't want to tell people what they can't eat, but we want to show them what they might enjoy and love. 
and kind of crowd out some of that food that may not be, you know, the best everyday food with foods that they um, might actually be surprised that they like. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And thanks for joining us. Oh, this has been such a great conversation. And thank you for inviting me on. Absolutely. And we will include links um, in our show notes in terms of getting getting onto your website, which, like I said, has tons of great resources for parents link to your book as well. And then also um, a link to your preschool curriculum in case anyone feels like that's something that they might be able to institute or introduce to their own preschool or preschool in their community. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been such a nice opportunity. You bet. And then, of course, please go ahead and and share um, any of the Facebook links that we have on our website for this episode on your site, and we'll enter you to win a free copy of uh, Dr. Yum's book. And please, if you're enjoying these episodes, make sure and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Like and rate our podcast and we will see you next Monday, every Monday with a new episode. Thanks.